Please remain standing and out of the Gospel lesson as I read this morning from John's Gospel, chapter 20. I'll be reading verse 1, followed by 11, 316. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you carry him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. This is the word of God. For the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. There's a story called The Secret Garden. It's a story of a little girl who has tragically lost both of her parents and she's suddenly become orphaned. She's sent to live with her uncle. Her uncle has a huge estate. Seems to have everything in the world. It seems to be the perfect place for this little girl to go. But her uncle had also experienced loss. He lost his wife. And so he was despondent. He was discouraged. He lost hope. And so you can imagine that household. Here was a little girl, broken hearted, seemingly everything lost, living in this household where there was nothing but, but grief and darkness and sadness. Over time, the little girl became friends with the gardener on this estate. And the gardener said to her one day, he said, listen, listen, there's a secret garden here. Go find it. Go look for it. And tell me what you see. And so the little girl went and searched for this secret garden. And one day she came back and she told the gardener with this sad look on her face, I found the garden. <clears throat> the garden seems dead. What do you think? garden's dead. It's covered in weeds. It's all grown over. The gardener looked at the little girl and said, it was your aunt's garden. And I want you to look a little closer at it. Because, you know, in, in gardens, everything is wick. W-I-C-K. And she said, wick? What is wick? And he says, well, wick means that even when you see things that look like they're dead, even though it seems like things, like have, they have no life, when things are wick, life is still there. And the little girl, she, she brightened up and she said, oh, oh, you mean the garden will grow then? And the gardener said to the little girl, yes, it will grow. And it will be the grandest garden you've ever seen. And that garden did grow. It bloomed. It blossomed. And the little girl, oh, she was encouraged. And, and her uncle, seeing his, his wife's garden regrowing <coughs> and back to life, oh, it, he became less discouraged and hopeful. And they both found life in the darkness of that garden that has now come back to life. The garden lived again. Now, I don't know the author of The Secret Garden. I don't know if she intended to do this or was aware of what she was doing as she wrote the story The Secret Garden. But do you know the name of the little girl in the story? And if you read The Secret Garden, <laughs> take a guess. Mary. Her name was Mary. 
Just like the woman in the gospel lesson that we read about today, she too went to a garden, a garden that was dark, a garden that looked dead, and she was despondent, she was hopeless, she was lost. She comes in her grief and her doubts, but with the first rays of sunlight, Mary notices there's something very different about the garden. The stone that had sealed the tomb has been rolled away. And Mary doesn't go any closer at this point. She runs away from the garden. She runs to go tell Peter and John that something's wrong at the garden. They, they need to go see the tomb. The stone's been rolled away. So Peter and John, they run. There's a lot of running in the Easter story, if you don't notice. They run. They run back to the tomb. And they, they go inside and they, they see the cloths lying there, neatly folded, which was kind of unusual. But there they are, neatly folded. Jesus is not there. Now it says in the scripture that one of them believed, but they didn't fully understand all that they'd seen, even in that moment. And so these two guys, I think it's amazing that these two guys on the first Easter, they see the tomb is empty. They go home. They go home. That's all they're going to do is to go home because they're not sure of what they've seen. But Mary, she stays in the garden and she turns around and, and seeing this man standing there, she presumes him to be the gardener and he says, or she says to him, you know, if you've taken Jesus, let me know where you've taken him and I'll go and, I, and I'll get him and I'll take him away. She didn't recognize Jesus standing there. She didn't recognize that this gardener was indeed the risen Christ. You have to remember, for those of you who are that, that may be confusing. Why didn't she recognize Jesus? You have to remember she's gone through several days now of grief. She's been with Jesus as she's seen him beaten and whipped. She's been with Jesus as he was crucified. She's been with Jesus as he was laid in that tomb. She's coming back now to prepare his body for final burial. burial. Her heart... Her, her, her spirit is broken. She's so sad. So lost. Uncertain of where to turn. My family grew up in, I, I should say, my father's family grew up in West Virginia. And so we would always go back to West Virginia during the summers for vacation. And we always seemed to land there about the time that the West Virginia Fair, State Fair, was going on. Nice fair for the state of West Virginia, but he would always take us and we would enjoy the day together. When I was about six years old, went to the fair and somehow I got separated from the family. I couldn't find my mom, my dad, I couldn't find anybody. So rather than being the smart little child that I wasn't, <laughs> I started, rather than staying in one place, I started moving around, moving around, cows and pigs and amusements and all the different things, the different smells and people bumping into people. And I realized in my six-year-old mind that I was going to be stuck at the West Virginia Fair for the rest of my life. <laughs> I was never going to get away from there. And I bumped into people and I wouldn't recognize who they were because my eyes began to fill with tears. I was sad. I was despondent. And I would bump into people. I'd hear voices, but, but nothing made sense. I, I was lost. And I began to be overwhelmed with this feeling of, of hopelessness. And again, my eyes began to swell as the tears continued to come. And then I bumped into this man. I didn't know who it was, but he held me. And I looked up and I, I couldn't recognize who he was because my eyes were so filled with tears. And then he said, Tom, Tom, and my face brightened, <clears throat> my fears were relieved, because in that voice and in my name being spoken, I knew it was my father. I knew he had found me. And I knew everything was going to be okay. But I'd say all that to tell you I can relate some, some way to Mary's story because, again, my eyes were so filled with tears. I was so despondent. I was so grief stricken that I couldn't even recognize my own father until he spoke my name. And when he spoke my name, I knew I was in the presence of one who loved me very dearly. Mary heard her name. It 
wasn't until then that she turned and said to him, Teacher. She heard her name spoken by Jesus in a way no other person could speak her name. It was full of love. It was full of compassion. It was full of hope. She turned to him. And through those tear-filled eyes, even though she really couldn't see, she knew in the sound of his voice that she was in the presence of her Lord and her Savior. She ran from that place that day. A lot of running, like I said, at Easter. But Mary ran again to, to tell the disciples that she has seen the Lord. She has seen the Lord. All of her heartache, all of her worries, all of her concerns, everything that was burdened, burdening her, weighing her down, was relieved, taken away. I say that because there may be some of us here that are weighed down by a life that's dead. So much hurt, so much pain, so much discouragement, so much hopelessness. Wondering sometimes if God really cares. Wondering if God is really there, if God really is watching over you. It's been said that we crucify ourselves between two thieves every day. The thief of regret for yesterday and the thief of fear for tomorrow. Today we're reminded that the cross of our disappointment, the grave of our lost hope, the tomb of our broken hearts have all been defeated. You see, the great Easter truth is not that we are to live newly after death. Eternal life doesn't begin after we die. Eternal life begins the day you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We are to live new today in the here and now by the power of His resurrection, by the new life He gives us, not to live life for all eternity, yes, that's a part of it, but to live abundant life here and now and today. Easter becomes glorious for us, not in recalling what happened on that first Easter, to simply recall together in today in worship and recall as the body of Christ what happened on Easter Day. It's like John and Peter. John and Peter who came to the empty tomb and they looked inside and they observed and they walked away. They went home not fully understanding all that they've seen. To simply recall Easter today is to walk away from here to go home not fully understanding what we have seen. Instead, I invite you to experience the joy of Mary. In the presence of the resurrected Christ, hope is restored, burdens are lifted, all fear is gone. Love washes over her as she runs from the garden to share the good news that Jesus is alive.
wife seems dead. Take a closer look. Because through Jesus Christ, your life is weak. There is life where it seems like there's no life. There is hope where it seems like there's no hope. There's healing where it seems like there's no healing. In Christ alone, we have received resurrection power. In Christ alone, you can be born again. You can be raised to a new life. You can have the hope and the promise of life eternal. In Christ alone, that's what Easter is all about. It's our celebrating the risen Christ. The one who conquered death. The one who comes into the darkness of all our lives to bring light. In Christ alone, we have hope. That in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Thanks be to God. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn as we sing.